Today on Pilot's Discretion, our guest is longtime aviation journalist and industry sage Paul Bertarelli. He tells us the real story on unleaded avgas, his predictions for electric airplanes, and what he likes about J3 Cubs. Pilot's Discretion starts right now. Welcome, everyone. I'm your host, John Zimmerman of Sporties. Remember to visit sporties.com slash podcast for show links plus access to every episode of Pilot's Discretion. And as always, we welcome your comments by email, podcast at sporties.com. Today's episode should be a refreshingly honest one, I hope, light on cheerleading and heavy on facts. I'm really excited to have Paul Bertarelli with us on the show, a man almost universally respected in aviation, if that's possible, for his commitment to telling it like it is. He's editor-at-large for Belvoir Media, writing for titles like AvWeb and Aviation Consumer, and he also produces a number of excellent videos for those titles, which I highly recommend if you haven't seen them. Paul's a longtime pilot, logging many hours in his Piper Cub, among a variety of other airplanes, and also an avid skydiver. Paul, welcome to Pilot's Discretion. Thank you. My pleasure. I'd like to start with a topic that is both mind-numbingly boring, but also, I think, critical to the future of general aviation, which is finding an unleaded avgas solution. You've covered this topic probably more than anybody for long, uh, probably a decade or more. You once memorably described this process as, quote, a galactically slow train wreck which I think is a great description of the process. But then it seemed like at Oshkosh last year, maybe a breakthrough with Gammy's G100 UL. Since then, things seem like they've gotten quieter again. So what's really going on here? Are we going to get a drop-in solution? You know, this is a question for the ages, and, and I did call it a galactically slow train wreck. Well, it's gotten slower uh, in, in the intervening years. Last summer at Oshkosh, we did see the introduction, or, or at least the approval of the initial STCs for uh, GAMI G100 <clears throat> UL, which is a 100-octane unleaded fuel. It did not have, however, uh, the full list of uh, approved models that, that would allow it to expand to certain engines, uh, mostly the high-output engines, the, the, the IO 550s and the and the TEO 540s, those sort of engines. So that was supposed to be in progress. Uh, and at that point, the FAA specified some more testing for, for GAMI to do in their test cell. And uh, there are some other tests and technical considerations to be examined, uh, which they did. And uh, all of that has been processed through the Wichita ACO, Aircraft Certification Office. Uh, they devoted a, a, a full team to get this done and to and, and to keep it on track. And uh, all those T's were crossed and I's dotted sometime, I think around the end of February 2022. And that package was sent to FAA headquarters with the recommendation that the STC with the approved model list be signed and approved. And that's where it sits, as far as we know. So is the FAA obstacle here, obviously, the immediate one. But even with that out of the way, is that the only obstacle? Or are there other things here that are going to have to be addressed? Well, as far as the STC itself, it's a, it's a, it's a bureaucratic legal process. So once the uh, applicant, in this case, GAMI, has met all the requirements of the FAA test program, and the two parties sit down over, in this case, years. This has been going on for 12 years. Back and forth, they've, they've specified test requirements that, that this fuel uh, would have to be subjected to. GAMI met those. Uh, the FAA agreed that GAMI met those, at least the ACO did submitted all the test paperwork. So at that point, if you have met the requirements, then you are entitled to the STC. So that's one aspect of it. Second aspect of it is uh, fielding this fuel. So in order to do that, GAMI has an agreement with AvFuel, which is a major distributor of aviation fuels in the U.S., and it will be AvFuel's job 
to find the manufacturing and handle the distribution of this. And they are essentially committing to market development. They're going to find people who can make it. Uh, they're going to get it to airports. And that will be a, a process that requires investment and that will also take time. And a third aspect of it, which is really quite murky, is what's going on in the background here as far as the industry is concerned. Uh, the FAA has, uh, last fall, out of, out of blue, they announced this new program called EAGLE, which is supposed to follow up on the initial uh, Piston Aviation Fuels Initiative to, to certify a drop-in. Well, this thing came out of nowhere, and it specifies, as hard as it is to believe, an eight-year timeline to reach unleaded fuels. That would be the end of 2030. I mean, <laughs> the end of 2030, that's eight years. So we don't know exactly what uh, levers the industry is pulling in here. We, we, we know that they're not happy with the STC. They don't like an STC solution uh, to solve this problem. There are various reasons for that related probably to legal liability, and also the uh, the legal ramifications of of approving all those engines for a new fuel. It's it's a little bit uh, to them anyway uh, difficult to do this, and and so they want. In fact, the industry has always wanted what it what it couldn't have. It wanted a drop in fuel that's just like hundred low lead. Well. If you read any of the research on this, you would know that there's nothing like lead as an octane enhancer. Nothing. Nothing has come close. And and the Coordinating Research Council, that's a that's a group that the, funded by the oil industry does research. They looked at 279 blends over quite a number of years. This word goes back into the early 90s, if not the 80s. Uh, and they found about... Uh, at least a dozen that had promise that met the octane, but these things were not tested with uh, things like aging and they weren't considered for cost. You know, could you get these exotic materials that they required? So the industry, and by the industry, I mean the OEMs and the engine manufacturers are aware of this. And they have not supported the GAMI STC uh, at all. And in some cases, they have opposed it. And so... They are all signed on to this new Eagle process because, okay, here's another, this time a five-letter uh, expensive government project, uh, which they like because it's going to tel telescope this this process out uh, over, over if, if this comes to, to pass over another eight years. So they don't have to do anything. And the of course, the oil companies are happy with that because of the few who are making avgas, and it's about 180 to 200 million gallons a year. It's a high uh, margin prof, uh, uh, product, even though they don't make that much of it. It's easy for them. They've got the lead facilities. They just keep making it and keep making a little bit of money. So it's counter interest to them to have an unleaded fuel. I have a bigger picture question on this. And that is, you know, it seems like the industry is sort of being dragged in this direction partly by noises from the EPA and everything. Do pilots care about this at the end of the day? You know, it, it doesn't seem like something that pilots are driving for. They're interested, maybe they're involved, but what's your sense of outside of the OEMs and the business side, the, the general aviation pilot out there, what's their feeling on this issue? Well, we did a kind of an informal straw poll and uh, we found, if a memory serves, only about 30% were interested in an unleaded fuel. And something like close to half either weren't interested or thought that lead was not uh, an environmental issue or threat. So that answers your question. That I, I don't think there's a real groundswell of demand for this. What's your best guess from your standpoint on if the FA signed off on an STC What's a timeline like where you might actually be able to pump some unleaded fuel into your airplane at your local airport? That is just a complete unknown. Because consider this, 
Let's say that the FAA approves the STC, and I think they're going to have to. I, I, I think legally they're just in a box. So let's say they approve it, and let's pick a date, June 1st. When that happens, then all the paperwork is in place, and AvFuel can begin its effort of finding manufacturers and finding airports to place this fuel. They will find some because there are early adopters out there. There are always early adopters who are interested in this, probably in California, because as you've read, uh, a few of the California airports are, are trying to prohibit lead. So to, they'll probably find some outlets there. And then it just becomes a slow grinding slog of getting airports interested in carrying this stuff. And don't forget, it's going to cost more than 100 low lead. So now all of a sudden, if you have both available at an airport, which may happen for a while, there may be an overlap, well, the G100 may cost a little more. So now the pilot is confronted with, okay, do I want to do my bit for the environment here and my engine because I want to stop running leaded fuel and pay a little more, or do I want to go with 100 low lead? And, you know, you, this is going on now in real time. You, I'm sure you're aware of Swiss 94 UL product, mm -hmm. only made in Indiana. It's distributed to about a couple dozen uh, U.S. airports, most of them in the Midwest. And they're doing the same thing. They are trying to build a market for this fuel. It's comparably priced 100 low lead. It's great fuel. People you talk to really like it. But it hasn't really established a major market foothold. So G100 would be in that uh, uh, same kind of market situation. And I think it's just going to be years, a slow transition of years. And it's quite possible that they won't succeed at it. It's quite possible that the market will just reject it. No one knows this. But once they have the STC, they have a license to try. So let's turn to another somewhat related subject here, electric airplanes, which some people think is the answer to this problem is just forget about internal combustion engines and skate to where the puck is going, so to speak. It seems like these projects have been sort of two years away and always will be, uh, but there's been some news recently with Textron buying Pipistrel, uh, a company that's done a lot of work with electric airplanes and a company you've reported on many times. What's your best guess on what's going to happen there with uh, Textron slash Cessna taking over Pipistrel? I don't know. Um, it, it really depends on what the thinking in the corner office is, what it is they want to do with this. My thinking is that uh, their real interest is in uh, drone technology because that's where the market is. Defense expenditures are still high. Drones are a growth market, and you know we see what's going on in, in Ukraine now. Drones are a major part of this. Textron <clears throat> has, I think it's in its systems division, has a uh, has a drone, but it's not it's it's not a major system. So they may be wanting to buttress that a little bit, and and so Pipistrel is more than capable of that kind of work, and they have been doing that kind of work. They've been doing defense work. The last time I was there in 2019, they had quite a lot of that going on, I think mostly for the European market, but it could have been for the U.S. as well. I think they must also see that, uh, yeah, we want to have a position in electric training aircraft. It makes sense uh, for them to have that, but I don't know what the emphasis is going to be. And, you know, Textron be honest about it, doesn't have a great history of introducing new product. I mean, they've introduced a, a couple of diesels, canceled those. Way back in 2006, 2007, they were looking at a, a follow-on to the, what was it? Was it a 210, I think, that was at mm -hmm. the NG. Uh, they did a, some demos with it, did a flyby at um, AirVenture, and, and that one disappeared. Uh, they bought Columbia and ran that for not quite a decade and then abandoned it. So they don't have a real good track record of doing that sort of thing in aviation. I don't know about their, they, they acquire a lot of companies because they're an acquisitive company, it's sort of their modus operandi. So, you know, we just don't know what what their emphasis is going to be. And we don't know if they see this as the... Uh, Inflection point, you know, here we are. Okay, it's a 
coming up on the middle of 2022, uh, electric airplanes are getting a lot of attention, a lot of coverage. Maybe it's time to step in and accelerate that. And what they can do is is bring some investment to it. Doesn't really take a whole lot of investment, and uh, introduce some improved products. I don't think. Well, actually, I'll turn this around. Since you're you're a flight school, I'll ask you the question: Would you be interested in buying an airplane, an electric training airplane, that at best had a one-hour endurance and probably you know something like a three-hour cycle time? And if you're going to be legal, you really can't fly it for the hour. If you're if you're going to have the student, well, we have to adhere to the thirty-minute reserve. Would that school, would you as a school be interested? I think an hour is pretty short. I think even in 90 minutes or two hours changes it. Uh, and I think for a ho- high volume flight school, it could really pay off where fuel is a bigger part of your expense. It's a, you know, it's a high utilization asset. And so the more hours you can fly, uh, the better. So I think there's a role for an electric trainer, especially in medium and larger size flight schools, but I think an hour is on the ragged edge for, for endurance. I think it certainly wouldn't replace the whole fleet, uh, might replace some of the primary you know, training, but uh, I think they're going to have to get that, that endurance up beyond an hour before it really takes hold. Second question is, uh, you've seen the Pipistrel airplanes, the Pipistrel Velis. Do you think they're robust enough for the kind of flight school operations you do? I think that's actually the biggest struggle. You know, a lot of people, including to some extent us, have some scar tissue from the LSA introduction. We had a couple of sky catchers in our flight school. They were good airplanes. They weren't great airplanes. Uh, And the combination of being just different enough that there was some transition training required to jump into a Skyhawk and some of the maintainability, the, you know, ruggedness issues I think that's definitely an issue to be overcome. You know, you know it. These airplanes work hard. Airplanes going to fly, you know, thousands of hours a year, lots and lots of landings, lots of power cycles, and I think uh, that is something that didn't happen to the 172 or the Cherokee overnight. It took years and years and years of refinement to get there. So it's a big open question, I think, for a lot of flight schools. Yeah. So that that answers your question. Then um, the 90 minute endurance is within sight. That's there's no question that that's not an, uh, a barrier that can be overcome. It, it, it certainly will be. And, and probably if Textron funds some work at Pipistrel, they'll get there in a couple of years. And, and that airplane will be capable of, of 90 minutes, if not two hours. And that you're right. I think that does change the equation quite a bit. And, but they will have to, I think, Look at a redesign of the airplane because I think the uh, the Velis and the Virus from which it comes are just too light for American style training. Maybe other parts of the world, but but not in the U.S. Because even the Skycatcher was a little too on the light side, and the mm-hmm. Skycatcher the Skycatcher is a B fifty two compared to the Velis. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the Velis has is really light, very minimal structure. Uh, and, for for obvious reasons. So it'll be interesting to see if they look at the Velas and say, yeah, we're going to try to market this as is in the worldwide or in the U.S. I don't, I'm not sure they're going to do that. Uh, and they're, uh, Textron is uh, highly sensitive to liability issues, and I think they'll look at it in, in those terms as well. But they're getting some. They're getting a very creative company. They're getting a very sophisticated factory, more sophisticated probably than Cessna is at Independence. Uh, very creative and well-educated workforce. Uh, so they're, you know, the Pipistro is the leading electric aircraft company in the world. I mean, there's no question about it. So I, I was a little surprised at the amount of. The, the value of the sale, some of that may be uh, stock, or I don't, I don't know how they structured it, but I'd I thought it was in the range of 150 million, but it's actually we reported two thir- 235 million. All right, Paul, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with some more questions. 
Sporties is the number one headset dealer in aviation with the guaranteed lowest prices, helpful advice from our team of pilots, and a no questions asked test flight guarantee. We'll give you 60 days to fly with your new headset. If you don't love it, send it back for an exchange or refund. To shop the full selection of headsets from Bose, Lightspeed, David Clark, and others, visit sporties.com slash headsets. Now, back to pilot's discretion. We're back with Paul Bertarelli. And Paul, one other issue related to electric, certainly the buzziest part of the market, is these vertical takeoff and landing companies, urban air mobility, UAM, like Joby and Archer. And you wrote a very interesting piece recently about two problems you see with those businesses. You wrote, quote, one, there are just too many of them to imagine that anything but a giant shakeout is inevitable. Second, related to that, is that the urban air mobility concept supposed to sustain all these machines is looking, if not wrong, then not right either. So what do you think the most likely scenario is for the whole world of UAM as we approach, say, 2030? Yeah, 2030 is probably a good place to be thinking about it because that's uh, seven or eight years away. I think the airplanes are just remarkably capable, and and there's a lot of uh, creative engineering and real serious thought going into these airplanes, and 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 the people building them are serious about it. They've got, at least in the case of Joby, they've got a lot of capital, and when that airplane gets through certification, and I think it will although not to their schedule. I think it'll be a quite impressive uh, airplane. It'll have impressive capabilities. It'll have uh, vertical takeoff capabilities, has pretty good speed, probably practically in the range of 150 knots, and it, it will be easy to fly. You could get, with 10 minutes of briefing, you, you could get into that thing. I mean, it's a stabilized auto flight, would fly by wire and anybody could fly it. I think they'll go through a period of, frankly, crashes. They've already had one in testing. Uh, I don't think they're going to get this thing out of the box and get it to 10 to the minus ninth reliability. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but that's okay. That's That goes with the territory. They're inventing a new thing here. And I think they will find an air taxi role. I think they are good for that. I think... They just have a set of capabilities related to operating costs, noise, payload. All of that stuff comes together to make a really good air taxi in the right environment. So what is the right environment? The way Joby explains it, if you look at their proposals, they imagine, uh, and they're, they, they gave one just in Los Angeles, they gave one that envisioned uh, thousands of flights a day carrying between, I, I think their average load factor was about 2.5 in an airplane that can carry four occupants altogether, and these are all piloted. So basically what they're proposing is a, an aerial mass transit system, like a, any mass transit system. But to me, there are several problems with this. The first is, I don't really want to live in a city where I look up and I see nothing but UAVs going by. I think it's just, it's, it's a kind of uh, visual pollution that I'm not particularly interested in. Second, I don't think if you're concerned about congestion and climate, and they say they are, that the directionality of more vehicles with fewer people is the way to go. To me, it's fewer vehicles with more people, and that's urban mass transit, traditional trains, light rail. And they cost a lot more to build than the UAM vehicles will. And that's sort of their selling point is, hey, we don't need much infrastructure. But I think if cities and the world are, are, are going to get serious about uh, both congestion and climate issues, they're going to have to invest the infrastructure. That's all there is to it. And then once you have it, you have it, and it's basically all weather. You're not going to be, uh, you're not going to be um, have the system go down if it's raining or snowing, which is not going to be the case with UAMs. But the UAMs will fill in there because of their capabilities. I mean, there'll be spots for them that will just be. I think they'll just be fabulous at it for for a certain kind of thing. And the example I would give is uh, 
downtown New York City to Kennedy, say from the uh, 34th Street Seapoint Base to Kennedy, um, or maybe even LaGuardia, it's pretty close, but that would, to me, would be perfect for these things as a, as a premium service. So that's where I think they'll go. And, and a lot of them, of course, will be autonomous. So they'll become uh, cargo carriers. They'll find some military application. They'll find utility application where helicopters are now used, and, and they'll be, uh, someone in my blog described it as a decosted helicopter, and I think that's true. Yeah, I think you hit on an interesting point there that gets overlooked sometimes. There's the whole discussion about electric and vertical takeoff and autonomous and all interesting technological discussions, but there really has been, particularly on the part of Joby and some of these others, a focus on easy to fly. And that ties into something you've written about before than something I think about a lot, which is making aviation in general easier. And, you know, you've written before about how as much as you love flying a a tail dragger, the thing we really need to grow general aviation participation is to make it easier, to make it just, you know, a more forgiving activity. So give me your pitch on that. Why, Why do you think, you know, if we could magically get some trickle down benefits from some of this why would that make GA better if airplanes were just flat out easier to fly? Well, um, setting aside the cost for a minute, um, if I as instructor are going to take somebody, even in the Cub, and, and solo them, well, you know what a ordeal that is. I mean, it's a, it's an undertaking, and it takes a long time to get there, and you know, 10 or 12 flying hours over how many weeks. Whereas with uh, one of these uh, UAMs, Totally fly by wire, totally uh, stabilized auto rotation. It's like a it's like a DJI drone basically. I mean, it's the same kind of technology. So, you know, we give the guy uh, a generous hour of ground instruction, and we take him out and put him in here. And okay, you know, this is this is the switch. Turn the switch on, and this is the throttle, and this is the stick. And if you want to go up, you, however it's configured, you use the throttle and use a stick to point it where you want to go. And if you want to land it, you can land it manually or just push this button for auto land. I, that's that's real appeal to me. And I I'm not the t- I don't uh, of the school to say oh well, you know that's uh, that's kind of heresy. That's not real flying. Real flying has to involve a rudder and uh, the prospect of imminent death. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't really, I don't really buy that. I mean, I I would love to fly one of these things. I think they'd be great because, you know, to me, I like tail draggers and, and all the challenge, but, uh, you know, why am I flying? Eh, it gets down to watching the houses get smaller, right? That's, that's basically what it is. So if that's easy, hey, I'm good with that. But it won't be cheap. One more question, Paul, and then we'll get to our ready to copy segment. And this is a broader one on general aviation, which coming out of the pandemic, business aviation in particular, but also light general aviation has been on a pretty good stretch. Uh, Activities up, you know, used airplane airplane prices are up, training seems to be strong. What's driving this, do you think, and how long can it last? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, To a degree, the pandemic is driving it because we, certainly in business aviation, we know that people didn't want to fly on airliners, so they started booking charter, and the charter guys are running their wheels off. And then biz jet prices are through the roof. Used ones, I mean, it's just crazy. And then on the piston GA side, well, you know yourself that training is driving a lot of that because the airlines need pilots. Even though the airlines are so screwed up now, they can't match demand to uh, capacity. They still, long term, they need pilots. So you've got that going on. Then I think there's also a demographic bubble of, you know, the 45 year olds, people who are okay. They're they're getting to be somewhat uh, financially secure. They want to learn to fly, or they always wanted to learn to fly, and now they're doing that. And then there's a, a certain amount of uh, business travel, I think, uh, uh, and for, for light pissing aircraft. So I, I think all of that coming together has produced this bubble. And how long it can last? Geez, I have no idea. This pandemic disruption, though, I think is here a lot longer than people think. Yeah, I'm, I've 
every prediction I've made over the last couple of years has been way too short. So I'm, I'm A, out of the prediction business, but B, any that I've made, I would extend. So I uh, agree with you there. Yeah. All right, Paul, it's time for our ready to copy segment. This is where we close with some rapid fire questions. I'll throw out some random ones. You give me your quick answer. So are you ready to copy? Ready to copy. You've logged a lot of time in Cubs. What's the enduring appeal of these airplanes? Just plain cheap fun. Are light sport airplanes safer than traditional Part 23 airplanes? Generally, no, but it depends on the pilot. Are they, a getting back to what we talked about earlier, do you think light sport airplanes have found a niche in flight training? Minimal, but yes. Underrated or overrated, the Cirrus parachute? Underrated. And why is that? Because of its uh, impact on uh, the ability to sell airplanes that no other manufacturer has quite figured out, but they could figure out. I think it's instrumental in, in Cirrus's success. I would agree. You spent a lot of years at Oshkosh. What's your best tip for a first-time visitor that's not obvious? Spend more time, allow more time. Excellent tip. I, I, that was not on my list, but I, I think it's at the top of my list. Everybody underestimates it. Top Gun 2, finally coming out this summer. Will that give? Will that make aviation cool again? Will that give us a bump? Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to go really out left field here. You wrote about this last year. Do you think the Air Force has seen alien spacecraft? Oh, man. A little longer answer here. You know, I, I just saw a program called a Phenomenon that's, that's been making the streaming services. Uh, and I did a little, after I saw it, I did a little additional research. Um, my gut feel is no, because I'm a, a kind of a big believer in mass hysteria. But um, I'm beginning to uh, have my doubts about that. And uh, particularly around uh, all those sightings at uh, nuclear facilities. I mean, these are professional guys who shouldn't be susceptible to that. So... My my gut feel is no to maybe, but show me. You've seen a lot of change in the world of media, aviation media in particular, but just media in general throughout your career. Some of it good, some of it bad. Can you give me one good change and one bad change that uh, speaks to you? A uh, good change is that um, there are fewer barriers to good content providers finding an audience. The bad thing is there are fewer barriers to bad content providers making noise in, in the universe. There's, there's, there's basically, uh, there's no switch there. There's no gate. So, uh, and I have found that uh, much to my uh, disappointment is that people will really resonate with what I consider to be pretty bad examples of uh, of aviation journalism or presentations, but on the other hand, they they really appreciate really good stuff too. What's your most controversial aviation opinion that you're willing to admit to? That I'm willing to admit to. Hmm. The, oh, that um, that. I, I don't really believe that uh, only real pilots fly tail draggers. Only tail dragger pilots fly tail draggers. Amen. Couldn't agree more. I fly a lot of tail draggers and they're a lot of fun, but the idea that that's some type of badge of honor does not make sense to me. No. It's, a, it's kind of an old school opinion that uh, that I don't share. You've done a lot of jumping out of airplanes throughout your life. Thousands of them, I believe. So how would you describe the feeling of leaving an airplane like that to somebody who's never done it before? Well, you know, one of the ways to describe it is that if uh, uh, being in a boat is swimming, then being in an airplane is flying. But in fact, uh, when you leave the door of an, of an airplane, you're flying. Uh, you your body has L over D and it, it ain't much. It ain't much of a glide ratio, but it is a glide ratio. And, and people think, well, you're just falling. Well, yeah, when you're skiing, you're just sliding down the side of a mountain too. 
So it's a real uh, challenge to learn to do that well. And, you know, we do it in the wind tunnel too on, on, on the ground, which is, that's how we these days learn to fly. And uh, it, it's really appealing. It, it teaches you to uh, basically think, analyze, and act under extreme duress because, you know, you are got a cord adrenaline going there, and, and that really kind of causes a certain tunnel vision. So the, the skill is to fly your body and, and also learn to think and analyze while you're in free fall. A lot of fun. It's a great sport. I bet I've asked a dozen skydivers that question. That is the best analogy I've heard yet. I love that. All right, I'm going to quote one more article to you because I thought this was a great line you wrote recently. Quote, got to give GA credit. It's pretty good at circular firing squads. What did you mean by that? Well, I know that was in one of my, that blistering column I wrote about uh, um, 100 uh, low lead, uh, unleaded fuel after sun and fun. Uh, you know, I was sitting in that press conference forum and I realized I've been covering this for 12 years, 12 years. And now we're proposing another eight, 20 years to, to solve this problem. And, and so the, the, the circular firing squad part of it is, it has to do with internecine politics, is that the stakeholders, that includes the alphabets, it includes the manufacturers, the engine manufacturers, are all kind of to a degree in league with the FAA to extend this process out further rather than to find a, a real solution. And, you know, you, you often wonder what they know that we don't know or that they're not telling us. It's something, it's always something. And, you know, I, I wish I had that inside track, but, but you look at those processes and say, this, this is not a problem solving process. This is largely a political optics process. And, and I see that's what, it's going on now. It's just it's just gotten to a ludicrous level. Okay, Paul, our last question is always the same on pilot's discretion. You have one final flight. We want to know what are you flying and where are you going? Wow, that's a tough one. Because um, cause that, that, could, that could happen, you know, if I decide, hey, <laughs> I'm getting out of aviation. Oh, man, I don't know. Uh, I would probably... I had my druthers, I'd fly a TBM to the Cayman Islands. Sounds pretty good. Paul, thanks for being on the podcast. You're most welcome. Thanks for listening to Pilot's Discretion, brought to you by Sporty's Pilot Shop, training and equipping pilots worldwide for over 60 years. For more episodes and links to additional information, visit sporties.com slash podcast. I'm John Zimmerman. We'll see you next time on Pilot's Discretion. Oh,